Uh, so hello and welcome everyone to our presentation today on optimized ML ops with Edge Impulse, Blues, and Zephyr. And I do want to be clear from the start that while this is a very machine learning forward presentation, a lot of the concepts we covered today are really going to benefit those of us who aren't even building with ML. So you'll see what I mean in a bit, but on the blue side, especially, I can speak to how we've got some very much related and very exciting note card features to share. Uh, but let's start with that level setting question here. What even is ML ops and why should we care? I'll give you my perspective here. And I know we've got experts here that can contribute. But if you start by doing any Google image search on ML ops, you're going to get tons of Venn diagrams just like this one, right? Uh, which is the easiest way to start, right? ML ops sits at the nexus of machine learning, DevOps, and data engineering. The name itself, of course, comes from a combination of ML and DevOps. I guess the data engineering folks were left out to dry. But before I continue on the what, I thought it'd be useful to maybe talk about the why. Like, why does the practice of ML ops even exist? It is a definitely a relatively new paradigm, and therefore I'd say there's some arguments on how or even why it got started. Uh, if you want my opinion from a like a newbie uh, ML developer uh, perspective, one reason I would say that ML ops exists is because too often the machine learning development cycle it can maybe be trapped in the traditional waterfall mode of development, meaning this very logical but very linear path of building, building out requirements, creating your design doc, developing your model, testing it, deploying it, et cetera. Except we all know that that's not a very efficient reality today, right? As evidenced by the fact that um, there's a study here that showed 88% of commercial machine learning initiatives are stuck in development and testing. And at least partially because I would say that cross-team development, testing, implementation, all that is incredibly difficult. And once you're deployed in the field, and yes, I'm overgeneralizing here, but it can be difficult to improve those deployed solutions. So I think as IoT or as embedded developers, we can relate to a lot of these problems, frankly. So that's my really brief interpretation of the why in a very pragmatic sense. But continuing on with the what though is I think a great quote uh, that is, ML Ops is a paradigm that aims to deploy and maintain machine learning models in production reliably and efficiently, uh, which, yes, I stole from Wikipedia. Uh, but what I love about this quote, again, is how this idea of ML Ops also speaks to the struggles that we encounter just generally with embedded solutions, right? We're struggling to deploy and maintain our solutions in a reliable and efficient manner. So from the technical sort of hands-on perspective, what is ML Ops? bring to the table? Well, it's going to bring some of those continuous integration, con continuous deployment capabilities to the ML world. It's going to least lead to uh, an increase in automation, in tools that it can help us build better and more robust solutions. And hopefully a byproduct of this is improved communication, right? Improved collaboration across different disciplines, like the product team, like the development team, like the QA team, and so on. So Based on, I guess, what I'd say, this newfound knowledge of ML ops over, what, the last two minutes, uh, what does this mean for the IoT? Well, at the risk of repeating myself here, it's going to become easier to test across teams as everyone can tap into the same development pipeline. Uh, it's easier to fix bugs, right? Perform security updates after you've released a solution in the wild. Uh, in the same vein, you're not having to perform a, a massive fleet recall if a critical update or even new features need to be released. And along with CI and CD, we, we now get what I just made up, and that's CMI, or Continuous Model Improvement in the Tiny ML space. Um, and Tiny ML, for those of you who don't know, is machine learning on constrained devices, which is really a core piece of what we're going to talk about today. I guess we should have called this Tiny ML Ops. Maybe I didn't. Did anybody ever? I that? like that term, but I also okay. really like what you've got there, Continuous Model Improvement. I'm going to make note of that. <laughs> yeah. It's so... Definitely... So let's uh, translate some of what I just talked about into the real world. And today we have awesome representatives from th three key organizations who are all helping to improve ML and the IoT on a daily basis, that being the Zephyr Project, Edge Impulse, and Blues. So I'll do some quick introductions of our experts who are here. First and foremost, I'm pleased to have Benjamin Kabe with us. Benjamin is a developer advocate with the Zephyr Project. And from Edge Impulse, I'm pleased to welcome Owen Jordan and David Tischler. And from Blues, that's me, Rob Lauer, on the left. And with me today is TJ Van Toll, our principal developer advocate. So we are all here to 
one, we're going to learn about ML ops, right? And how each organization is really doing its part to improve development in this paradigm, if you will. But we're also here to show off a real world example of these concepts in action today. So we're going to start by kind of introducing Blues, Zephyr, and Edgeball separately. And then TJ is going to be here to tie everything together up into one perfect bow. Uh, I did want to mention, if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A or the chat panels that are provided. After we are done talking, we'll hopefully have plenty of time to answer as many of your questions publicly as we can. Speaking of questions, I always want to get one out of the way, and that is, is this being recorded? The answer is yes, uh, it is being recorded, and we will post it on the Blues YouTube channel um, under our old name of Blues Wireless. While you're there, I recommend subscribing to the channel, of course, so you're the first to see our new video content. So not only am I emceeing today, but I also get to introduce you all to Blues. Um, I know many of you don't know much about Blues, so I'm going to give a very quick intro. So Blues is a connectivity company that is focused on making cellular IoT easier for developers, if I can distill it down into one sentence. And that starts with the note card. The note card is a cellular IoT system on module. It comes with 500 megabytes of data, 10 years of cellular service, prepaid, all baked into the cost of the device. What makes Blues unique is that we don't have any subscription fees. There's no monthly SIM fees, but the note card is only half the story. The other half is our cloud service that we call NoteHub. And the two work together to form a device to cloud data pump. In practice, what this means is you as a developer, you buy a starter kit from, from us or you'll furnish your own hardware, you'll hook up a sensor to it, you'll start reading data with that host microcontroller and deliver that data securely over cellular to NoteHub. Now, to be clear, we are not here to create a platform to lock you in. We're, we exist to help you connect to your platform. Maybe it's a big cloud like AWS, if I can speak, or Azure or an IoT platform like a Ubi Dots or a Data Cake. Uh, so we're really trying to help solve this messy middle piece of connectivity, if you will, so you can easily and securely connect your devices to your cloud applications. So the note card is the core hardware we provide. I do want, I want to do a quick rundown on it. It is a low power system on module, um, consumes eight microamps when idle. It does have an M.2 edge connector for embedding in your project. We also offer carrier boards that you can use to connect to your host MCU. Um, there are cellular and Wi-Fi variants of the note card. Cellular includes a GPS module as well. Uh, as mentioned, the cellular note card comes prepaid, 500 megs of global data, 10 years of global service. You can top them up if you need to. There is an onboard embedded SIM, but the note card also provides support for uh, dual SIM support and the ability to switch between them if need be. Uh, what's really unique about the note card is the API is all JSON based. So there's no AT commands to manage your cellular modem. It's all a JSON based API. Uh, and to use that JSON based API, we provide SDKs uh, for popular languages and Zephyr, of course. And there's note card varieties that work globally using popular cellular standards. So again, everything JSON in and JSON out with the note card API. As an example, if you want to get your cards your note card's GPS location, you call this request card.location, and it's going to return the requested location. Uh, the rest of the API is set up very similar to this. Uh, and if you're asking yourself, well, JSON and C, how do I do that? Well, we provide a library that abstracts that complexity. So you're making JSON requests and parsing JSON responses um, in C from the note card. Now, to help kind of visualize what I just told you in the last couple minutes, like kind of where the note card and where NoteHub might sit in a given solution, I've got a quick diagram here. You're going to bring your note card or your note card. You're going to bring your microcontroller or your single board computer. You're going to furnish your own sensors, your own language. You are not dictating any of this, your own RTOS. Uh, you're going to compose packets of data, packets of JSON data that we call notes. These notes or these events are skewed, they're stored on the note card, and then at a cadence you specify will be synced with NoteHub. Now, again, we don't want your data to live on NoteHub. We're not trying to lock you into NoteHub. We want you to route that data out to your cloud app of choice. So you can consume this data, you can transform it on the way out to optimize it for your provider. So that could be, again, a big cloud, or it could be an IoT provider like uh, UbiDots or UbiDots, UbiDots, Locent, or uh, Datacake. Those are the three. I typically recommend people. So that is a very quick intro to Blues. And today, TJ is going to show off 
two key note card features that play into tiny ml ops uh one is kind of new well it's new this year ish and that is a feature we call it's a long one note card outboard firmware update uh the other is brand new and it's a new super efficient way of sending and receiving large binary payloads with a note card this is probably our top requested feature even though the note card was designed as a low bandwidth device um, and sending sensor data everybody wants to send images right with the note card so it's finally here um, it's in testing today and it will be a reality very soon soon as in the next probably week or so in the note in a note card firmware update so what is a uh, nofu or note card outboard firmware update it really does represent a new way of performing remote over the air device firmware updates uh, it is an industry first in many ways performed uh, in a low code manner it works completely independent of your RTOS or programming language. The note card itself is actually controlling the DFU process, which is what makes it unique. So you can actually recover brick devices in the field. Uh, you can perform partial program updates. Uh, maybe most importantly, it works on all modern ESP32 and STM32 based microcontrollers. Uh, we will actually soon be supporting hosts that support MCU boot as well, such as I might be wrong here, but I think I'm right. The Nordic NRF91, 53, and 52, I think all support MCU boot. Zach can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and the binary payload feature. So this is coming in, in the next version of the note card firmware. This does include the new card.binary APIs. And those are going to allow you to, to, um, to store binary data on the note card flash and then send that to the cloud. Uh, also receive binary payloads from a cloud endpoint as well. So obviously we're talking about machine learning, tiny ML today. And so this is a really exciting feature for us as it allows for remotely collecting data, even images, you know, if you're working with a vision-based ML model and then combined with note card outboard firmware update and edge impulse, you can, you can start to gather data remotely, send it to the edge impulse ingestion API using the note card and note hub, train a new model in the cloud with edge impulse, and then securely deploy it back to the host with the note card uh, and note hub, but I'm giving, getting way too far ahead of myself. Um, instead, I'd like to pause and uh, turn the stage over to Benjamin to uh, enlighten us all on our favorite RTOS, that being Zephyr. Uh, Benjamin, do you want to take over here as I, yeah, as soon as you stop sharing, sounds good. Perfect. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'll try to be, to be quick, but, uh, like, um, uh, like we said, a quick, quick intro to to Zephyr, and Zephyr is essentially an open source real-time operating system that um, is probably a good companion when it comes to uh, doing tiny ML uh, and having ML running on uh, small and tiny devices. So in um, in a nutshell, what Zephyr is really is uh, uh, all the building blocks you need for, uh, for your embedded application, uh, Hardware abstraction, the ability to do uh, uh, multitasking, and like we'll we'll dive into that deeper. But um, one thing that's worth noting is that it's typically really really small and optimized. Uh, as in, uh, I mean, it can fit on really small um, microcontrollers and MCUs. Uh, you really don't need uh, many resources for for it to be available. And the, the trade off between bringing Zephyr to to the mix versus trying to just not use it and reinventing the wheel uh, is usually, I mean, yeah, the math <laughs> is usually pretty easy to, to, to do. Uh, and it's, it's, re it's really scalable. Like you, you would find Zephyr in really, really small devices, but uh, uh, it's also uh, something that, that that's supporting the embedded firmware of uh, some uh, very popular laptops out there, like the Chromebooks, for example, they are uh, powered by Zephyr under the hood. Um, and it's meant to be really, really flexible uh, and, and customizable. And when it comes to um, to ML, that's actually really important. One way to uh, to think about it is in the light of uh, the the silicon shortage that we are still sort of in the in the middle of, right? Like it's when you design some some form of embedded product, um, you might or might not end up shipping uh, a product based on exactly the same kind of hardware and a uh, bill of material that you had in mind initially right and uh it's one thing to 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 think about changing from temperature sensor a to temperature sensor b from a hardware perspective you might need to redesign your boards and blah 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 but 
you also need to do uh, to do the upgrades and the updates uh, on the soft software side of things. And uh, if you have um, some kind of hardware abstractions to support you in doing so, uh, it's going to be much easier to be really independent from the, the the hardware, right? Or to add new new sensors to the mix uh, further down the road. And um, and it's uh, thought with uh, and it's I mean. Although it's really modular, uh, Zephyr is actually also uh, really secure. Like the the way the um, the system is designed, you can uh, actually um, like when you perf perform remote firmware upgrades, like we uh, we are just discussing, uh, you can have all the uh, all the workflows in place so that your firmware is effectively signed and use the hardware root of trust on your device and and things like that. And um, maybe the uh, best uh, thing uh, I, I kept it for for the last slide uh, it's open source uh, so there's um, a crazy active actually community on github of uh, thousands of uh, people who uh, on a, on a day-to-day -day basis make Zephyr a reality and every every four months you, uh, you you get a new a new major release of Zephyr and uh, it's supported by um, a really uh, vibrant ecosystem and many if not all of the uh, silicon vendors out there they support Zephyr in uh, one capacity or the other and you would have like if you care about ESP or uh, STM32 like, like like it was mentioned before then you can use Zephyr. If you're more like a Nordic person, you have Zephyr as well. Uh, if you're not so much about ARM, but you use other other types of uh, architectures, uh, well, like Extensa for Espressive, um, there's support for that as well. And uh, there's tons of products available out there. And uh, without going into many details, I think you can all imagine that many of the products here uh, on, on this map, on this chart, in one form or the other, they um, they actually have some ML and some tiny ML um, capabilities, right? And uh, why is uh, Zephyr a good choice for that? Uh, let, let me tell you about it, because there's, I mean, there's many ways to approach embedded development. Some of you might uh, be prototyping or even going production maybe with an approach where you're very much uh, bare metal and you're like really, really close to the, uh, to the, the low level um, uh, hardware functionalities, maybe some of you are more coming from a an Arduino kind of approach where you leverage the uh, actually quite vibrant ecosystem uh, of, of libraries that come uh, with, with Arduino, but the programming model might not be quite enough when it comes to, um, to um, ML use cases. Like you want to do remote management of the models, you want to um, do sensor um, data acquisition, things like that. So yeah, some things might not be uh, that easy if you don't have the support of, of a real-time operating system. Briefly, but I will send you all to the website to, to learn more, but uh, whatever hardware you're using and potentially complementing with the, uh, the, the note card uh, for, for, for remote connectivity, it's likely supported in Zephyr. Like there's hundreds and hundreds of boards that just work. Um, they have out of the box support for, for Zephyr. And why would you, for any of those boards, again, you could probably just use um, Arduino or like the, the the vendors, really low level um, hardware absorption layers to, to build your um, ML and tiny ML application, except that um, you probably want to use an Arctos. And uh, some of the things, in no particular order uh, that uh, the Artos is really going to help you with uh, are things like um, uh, having actual multitasking and the ability to do multiple things in parallel. Uh, although you're running on a really small device, uh, very uh, uh, limited amounts of, of memory and processing power, there are several tasks that you kind of want to do in parallel, right? Like the sensor data acquisition, the um, the ML inference, like all of these tasks, they have to run in parallel. And if you have the sort of old approach of um, uh, the like this embedded programming model where you do everything in some kind of infinite loop, what happens if any of the things that you're doing during uh, this um, that you're doing during this this step uh, are taking long, longer than expected. You are um, refreshing your graphical user interface. Uh, it might actually interfere with the um, the sensor acquisition um, process, right? And so you want the real time operating system to help you with this ability to do multiple things in parallel to manage the priorities and things like that. You want especially when you're thinking tiny ML, you're thinking battery powered, um, you want the OS, the underlying platform to take care of making sure that you're gonna get the best battery life as possible, right? You don't wanna 
try and manage uh, how you should put your sensors uh, in idle mode um, manually, right? It's it's really something that, I mean, it works on a regular desk, desktop operating system. Why, why not getting the same kind of uh, um, benefits from an, uh, like on embedded? It, that's what the Zephyr does. Um, something that also, just like, again, a good old desktop operating system, I guess, is making sure that you get how good hardware abstraction from like abstraction from the the actual processor or microcontroller that you're going to use because again silicon shortage and you might want to um switch uh, uh gears uh for if for some reason you cannot really source the the, the component you had in mind but also for from a sensor perspective like you're starting uh, to use a, a particular temperature sensor you don't want to rewrite all your um software you don't want to Potentially, you don't even want to like retrain your model, right? If you're switching from one class of temperature sensor to the other, uh, the OS should take care of most of the of this, right? Um, then the connectivity, of course, like when it comes to a tiny ML, usually it's, it goes hand in hand with IoT, and you want to send your business data to uh, a cloud platform, potentially using the node card or like direct uh, IP or LoRaWAN connectivity. You want to leverage Bluetooth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera there as well you don't want to like reinvent those stacks and you don't want to maintain those in your in your code base right and so that's um yeah that's the kind of things that you want to get from uh, your artos and uh last one um the ecosystem of libraries that just happen to work right like similarly i guess to to arduino which to some extent brings you uh libraries that just work um you want to you want that right and with uh, zephyr artos you get uh, like tons of libraries to support your uh, like cryptography and uh, data compression and whatnot. And also, of course, the kind of libraries that can help actually power your um, your ML inference, things like TensorFlow Lite, which uh, Edge Impulse would, um, would reuse so that uh, you get the smallest possible models with the best possible performance based on the actual hardware capabilities that you have on your MCU, right? And so that's... Yeah, kind of like the brief overview of what um, are all the things uh, that uh, may happen on the embedded side of things when it comes to doing um, uh, tiny ML and, and ML ops. But the ops side of things, uh, a lot of it is probably happening more uh, on the cloud side of things. Um, and uh, yeah, without further ado, I guess we can switch to uh, maybe, and we can all learn more about what's what's happening uh, there with things like Edge Impulse. And if you want to learn more about Zephyr, I will be hanging out in the chat. Uh, plus you can uh, check out some of those links, our Discord documentation, things like that. Awesome. Thanks, Benjamin. Yeah, David or Owen, you guys want to? Take the wheel. Yeah, I think Owen may have some slides coming our way. I sure do. Let me just get them now. <laughs> yeah. go. Thanks, Benjamin, as well. Thank you. If people do have questions and whatnot, uh, feel free to hop in the chat. Q and A is we're bringing this up. Just let me know when you see my slides. They yep. are coming through now. Looks yep, good. got them. Okay. Um, so just wanted to give a quick intro to Edge AI and Edge Impulse and who we are and what Edge AI means, as that's what we're going to be updating here. So why all the hype about AI and what do we care about it? Um, this slide would just kind of show us kind of the, the hype that's going on at the moment and uh, where ML belongs within this uh, umbrella of AI. And tiny ML specifically is uh, applied to the likes of the MCUs and swans that we're uh, familiar with in our IoT world. So some of the benefits of Edge AI are kind of seen as the some of the concerns or issues people may have and the things that you're trying to overcome um, by using swan and the uh, note card and note hub. So privacy is one of the main concerns, uh, power, cost, reliability, bandwidth, and latency as well. So I know that you're, you've are you already mentioned some of this. And so machine learning um, is applied to uh, microcontrollers is a real paradigm shift here. So 
I know Benjamin mentioned about being trapped in the super loop and with the traditional programming that we're familiar with um, from the uh, likes of Arduino, um, where we can work with sensor data and we can build some rule based um, pro uh, programs or, or sketches. And then we can, based on thresholds and uh, inputs that we get from those sensors, we can, um, we can imp implement our own rules. But machine learning, we can start to uh, gain insights from when we know that we've got inputs uh, from sensors in a certain scenario, let's say um, a motor is starting to perform poorly, we know that it's going to reach a certain condition, we can train our model, we can um, we can build our algorithm to, to detect that uh, once we've got new uh, inputs to the uh, algorithm or model that we've deployed to our device. So then we can start to solve problems that we uh, were not able to do previously. Um, and it's simple things like thresholds. And today we're talking a little bit about machine learning and uh, uh, that's broadly broken into three categories, the supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. And mainly we work with uh, supervised learning where we uh, try to classify a problem like the motor going into a bad condition. Um, and anomaly detection, where we try to detect if there is a flaw or a anomalous condition in the motor. But um, you can get into scenarios then as well, where <clears throat> over the course, over the lifetime of a, of a sensor, that sensor can start to degrade. And then you could get to a, a, a situation where you get into model drift. And that kind of plays into where you might want to update your model uh, on the fly. and the OTA that uh, TJ is going to uh, demonstrate late, later uh, plays into that. So that's embedded machine learning broadly. And what we what we bring here as well is uh, digital signal processing. Uh, so we've got our processing blocks where we can extract features from the signals that come in from our sensors and we can use those features to feed our neural network and altogether when that's de uh, deployed to a device with firmware um, we uh, refer to that as a impulse so i'm not going to go too far into this here but um so i can just maybe talk about where we would use edge ai and machine learning in practice and typically um Predictive maintenance is the main area that we see here. And um, in a IoT scenario, you may also see um, supply chain optimization here. And I'll just talk briefly about our uh, Edge Impulse as a platform. And we work with you through uh, the, the whole stage lifecycle of uh, developing your model and getting that to deploy to your device. So we uh, have a platform that can help you collect data from any sensor, uh, any device. You can design and build your model to um, on our UI, and then you can test it and iteratively um, improve your model and deploy it to your device. And that includes the firmware on your Swan. Um, so that's not really the end of the story. Then once the once the model is deployed to your device. Uh, we see that it, it will play into the MLOps um, story as well, because you need to be able to access and update this uh, over the over the life cycle of your um, deployment to your uh, device or your uh, product. So, yeah, I guess we're kind of uh, talking through this um, story as as we're um, as we're learning really with you um, how you're going to be applying this. So. I'm just going to skip on here. I don't want to give. I don't want to go too much into this because I know we did it the last time, and uh, I don't want to take too much time from the um, the demo that That's I want to see here. Shameless plug to go watch the previous video. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, I just feel. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to go through too much here, but um, the the cycle here that you can that you can see that's starting to build is that we we need to be able to improve these models and um. We are seeing this as a as a as an ask, and it's important that uh, we can see this demonstrated by uh, partners that we work with, like Blues. And so I yeah. just eager you know, to and actually, uh, 
Oh, and can yeah. you go back one slide? And I'll be I'll be very very quick here. But this is a perfect example here of okay, collecting your data. That's an upfront task, building your data set. And then you're going to essentially build your model based upon that data, that data set. So the design and testing of the model, deploying the model to the device in the field. Okay, great. But Sean and I were just having a side conversation and he used a great example that quite honestly, I hadn't even really thought about, which is very simply the weather and how it may affect your model out in the field. He's using an example of a device that is monitoring large power transmission, electric transmission, the big towers that run the long range distances. And um, if you have a device that's monitoring those particular, I don't know, voltage current, you know, going across, I'm sure the, the just the, the insane amount of power going across those wires, but, um, and you deploy and build your model and it's based upon, quite honestly, the summertime weather. Well, what happens once winter comes? You may, in fact, want to collect a new batch of data, ingest that back to Edge Impulse, retrain your model, look for any differences, compare, see if your model has in fact improved or quite honestly, there's just drift or differences between what you originally trained on summer weather versus what you see out in the field now, winter weather, and then redeploy that model back to the device again. And it's just a very simple but great illustration of why you may need to do this. Yeah. So so I guess we, we won't waste too much more time here um, going through the slide where I just mentioned about our UI, you can see here visually that you're able to collect your data and we can give you cues to, to, to advise you how much test and train data that you should have for your model to get it of a, of a good good condition. We'll guide you through the steps to build your algorithm um, through our impulse design here. As we create impulse, you'll see your data start to flow in and you'll get suggestions about how to add that. We'll have um, stars next to the ones that we believe fit your scenario. And really, you'll just you'll fly through the the creation of your first model, and deploy it to your device. And you can do that with Zephyr by using the C plus plus library. And then we've got some guides on how to do that as well. And without further ado, I'd like to get to the demo. So thanks so much. Thank you. And awesome. I, I can definitely attest. If if any of you are new to Edge Impulse, uh, it is pretty wild how quickly you can go through and build your own model and. Um, and train it and and deploy it. So awesome. And I want to just sort of end here by trying at least trying my best here to put all the pieces together and show all of this working in one place. So what I've got on my screen is a couple of different things. On the left is some Zephyr firmware that's gathering up some accelerometer data here. And it's basically using some edge impulse code, putting it into a buffer. Using the note card to transmit this data, I'm going to high level walk over all of this and then we'll jump back into this into some detail. And then using a method of the note card to basically post this up to the web to a proxy route that's going to use the Edge Impulse ingestion API to send this accelerometer data into Edge Impulse. A long story short, basically, I have some Zephyr firmware that's taking accelerometer readings. Those readings are then getting funneled into Edge Impulse through their ingestion API. So right now I have some hardware sitting on my desk. The accelerometer is idle. Uh, if I start to move it around just a little bit and wait 15 seconds for this to take another reading, you see these numbers are jumping around a little bit. It's going to hit my uh, route that's going to funnel this into Edge Impulse. It takes a second or so for that data to pop up and see there's me shaking it around. Now, the reason I'm showing this and the reason I think this is kind of cool is that this data is being transferred using the note card, meaning this data is coming across over cellular. And the reason I think that's really interesting, it gets back to the point David made earlier of wanting to collect data with your sort of real hardware to use the sort of power example. It's very hard to get data for this in your sort of contrived scenario, or at least your model will be less accurate if you're getting data in a very um, uh, sort of contrived lab situation. It's far 
better or just far, uh, you can build higher quality models if you're actually collecting data from your devices out in the field. And because the note card is using cellular, I could take this device that's sitting on my desk, I could walk out into my yard, I could attach this to a truck, I could be on some sort of industrial equipment and being and being and having this ability to gather this ML model and basically just funnel it into Edge Impulse, which from there I can do my work to sort of refine my model, build new versions, and even use the note card to push new versions of that model out to my firmware. Now, I said a whole lot, I, but I wanted to start with the, the overarching view. And what I want to do is break down pieces of this into a little more detail. I'm going to start with the hardware because I haven't been showing that. I'm going to hold it up for a second, but I'm going to focus on a picture on my screen. So what I'm holding up is this, which will be a little bit easier to see. This is the standard Blues starter kit. The starter kit comes with the pieces of hardware you see here. The note card in green, which is the module that's doing the cellular communication. The note carrier, which is the rectangle. It's a development board that just houses the note card, lets you do developer convenient things like give it power, expose the pins, attach peripherals, things like that. The Blues Swan is this microcontroller here. It's an STM32 based microcontroller. This is what's running the Zephyr firmware on the left-hand side of my screen. And the final piece of hardware is this guy, this LIS3DH, this is the accelerometer. It's like a $5 accelerometer that I found on Adafruit. Uh, really, you can run this sort of setup with any accelerometer. But if you want to follow along and build uh, exactly what I have, uh, you can just grab that one. I have links to both in this GitHub repo, which I'm going to link up in the chat, or maybe Rob can, because I think he has it in his slides if you want to check that out. So this is the hardware. This is uh, what's sitting on my desk. The only difference is I've got it plug in through USB to give this thing a little bit of power. Now, the firmware running on the Swan is this Zephyr firmware. And this is running using an SDK that we have for the note card, our Zephyr SDK. So just to show that off, if I go to our docs on blues.dev and bring this up, the cool thing about our Zephyr SDK is not only does it provide an easy means of talking to the note card in a Zephyr-based app, we also provide a pretty cool development environment that's based off Docker and VS Code that actually packages up all of the requirements, the dependencies to run a Zephyr-based app. So I think it's a pretty cool way, even if you have no interest in using the note card, it's just a kind of an easy way to get started with Zephyr in general, because you just get a little functioning app that's set up and ready to go with the note card and ready to use. So if you're curious more about how that works, if you just search for Zephyr on blues.dev, uh, you can get through here, find all the details of exactly how this works. And that's providing the skeleton of a lot of what I have running over here in firmware. A couple things I do want to point out, especially if you are brand new to Blues and to the note card. So Rob mentioned earlier that the note card is based off JSON APIs. We provide SDKs for a variety of different platforms to make it easy to send that JSON to the note card. You're seeing that in action in Zephyr over here. The first thing I'm running or the first thing I'm telling the note card to do is this hub.set request. This is what's going to associate the note cards, uh, the physical hardware, with a cloud backend. So Note Hub is our cloud backend that the note card knows how to talk to. This product, which I have set up here, is going to associate, make the mapping so that the note card knows where to send data to and from. You see my, my device over here is online. Under that, I have this card.dfu request. We're going to put a pin in that and come back to that in just a minute. This is what's going to make our firmware update possible. So we'll skip over that for now. And underneath that, we have our loop that's actually going to be gathering up accelerometer data. Now, if you've worked with Edge Impulse before, you might recognize some of this code because I pretty much took it straight from their docs and their Zephyr samples. So when you build a model in Edge Impulse and you get to the point where you're deploying your model, you get some of those models that uh, Owen was showing. Basically, it gives you some of this code so that you're collecting data at the interval that Edge, Edge Impulse expects. That's where these different constants come through. And really, our job is just to get that data and sort of queue it up. So I'm getting these floating point values. I'm just tossing everything in one big buffer. So at the end of this, I just got this chunk of memory with a bunch of floating point accelerometer readings. Now. Before with the note card, this was kind of the end of the story because 
Uh, Rob mentioned this earlier, but the note card is not really a high bandwidth device. It's a cellular device that's primarily used to do things like capture sensor and sort of geolocation, uh, location types of readings. What's new as of today is our card.binary APIs and the method for interacting with that are you're seeing down here through note binary transmit. Now, what this is doing is taking this buffer, it's putting it into a designated area of flash onto the note card that's been reserved for exactly this workflow. There's some metadata provided for it. And then basically these APIs work with conjunction with, a, with another request of the note card called web.post so that anything you've queued up in this area of flash, if you provide this binary flag, is gonna be sent to this route so that you essentially can queue up some data to be streamed out. Now, I'm gonna show this route in a second. First uh, though, Zach, I know you're on the call and Zach was uh, the person that was uh, the primary person behind this. So am I missing anything? Did I characterize that correctly? Or is there anything else you want people to know about the API? Yeah, no, you did a really great job. Um, the Like you said, it's what we did was we artificially constrained the size of the note card binary so that we could have flexibility with choosing which chips it should run on. Uh, and in doing so, that made an, an additional chunk of extra space that we just never used. And so uh, instead of just letting it sit there and do nothing, we decided that we, would, we could solve the uh, large binary transfer problem by allowing access to that uh, dead space. And so that's that's actually where the space came from and uh, how this is all working. So, but otherwise, TJ, you did a great job. You described it almost perfectly. So, yeah, and the thing that the biggest difference, I think, for people that use no card before is just how fast it is. And you can kind of see it as it's been running here. Like, this is a non trivial amount of data. Like, you can see it <laughs> floats everywhere. Right. And these things appear basically to the back end instantaneously and then take a second here to show up in Edge Impulse. So it's quite fast to work with a, a pretty serious amount of data. So and one thing I cool. want to I want to doubly clarify is that TJ is obviously showing an accelerometer demo. You can do the same exact it's the same exact process basically for like sending uh like an image or um uh, you know any kind of like a zip file, anything that you want to send over can be done the same in the same manner. Uh on the back of that, I will say, like, you mean an ML image. Like, if you're showing, like, a iPhone image that's, like, I don't know, for the <laughs> right. 12 megabytes now, you will have no data in <laughs> yeah. the time. So be, be reasonable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so what, where this data is actually going, so we've queued up in this buffer, we post it. In the Node Hub side of thing, you have to configure a proxy route, which is what you're seeing here. And just notice this ingest maps up here. Basically, this is just funneling the data into this endpoint that I've set up. And what that endpoint needs to do, and I've got a sample of this here to show a, an example way that you can implement this, uh, but really you just need a server that can accept a post. So this is written in JavaScript and Node, but this could be written in your favorite language of choice, your favorite uh, whatever. We have people, Rob likes to do this in C Sharp. We have a lot of Go fans and a lot of Python fans at, at Blues. Uh, so you could write this using any of those approaches. But regardless, your two tasks are to, to basically pluck the data out, and in this case, to send the data to Edge Impulse. So in JavaScript, the way that works, or in Node, is that I'm going to be getting data from my payload. JavaScript has this handy little git float 32 that's going to be plucking those floating point values out. It's going to just push this into an array and really all that array is gonna be used for is later down here. This is the Edge Impulse Ingestion API. So I have to send it some metadata. In this case, I've got X, Y, and Z values, the values themselves, and I'm gonna post those to Edge Impulse. So that the full flow is basically collect my data in here, use note binary transmit in the card.binary APIs to post that to my endpoint. My endpoint then sends that end to Edge Impulse so that I'm building up this data set uh, with data that I'm collecting. Now, I should mention that this is kind of the, the naive approach. This is a demo that's kind of focused on just showing you the plumbing and not how you might actually want to use this. In a realistic scenario, you'd probably want to use the approach that Benjamin talked about earlier, where this was kind of running on its own thread. Right. This is the super loop. Benjamin can like shield his eyes here so he he doesn't see this because he probably wouldn't approve of this. 
but you'd probably move this to its own thread and have this trigger under certain different circumstances. So maybe you only care about collecting data during certain times of day, like a certain times of day you wanna go online, collect some data, throw that into your model, maybe only on certain devices, maybe only on certain conditions. You can even use a feature of NoteHub called environment variables. So on each device, you can set different variables. You could create one and say like, it is capture time. And when you set that to true, your devices will start sending data into your model. But really this is just focused on the plumbing of how you get your data there. And you could take this from there and sort of customize it for whatever workflow makes sense to you. Now, the last thing I want to show is, so you've got this sort of start of your ML ops process where you're now able to collect data out into the field and put it into your data set. Presumably then you have your data engineer doing all your edge impulsey things. You're you're go putting this into your design, your training sets, your training, you're going crazy, you're testing this out. And at some point you'll end up with an updated model. You think like, oh, I've got my winter data for my power generator, but now my power generator, I've maybe I've got 10 of them out there. They need this updated model so that they can work better. Ideally, you'd have the ability to update that model on your device. And that's where the second feature, if you remember back to Rob's slides, we're talking about binary transmissions and also uh, firmware updates on devices. And that's where a feature of the note card called no card outboard firmware update comes into play. And I'll once again, uh, accidentally close instead of open. Once again, bring up the blues.dev documentation, do a quick search for outboard firmware update. That's what you want to do if you want to read about this feature in depth. But when I discuss this, I like going to this really quick and simple check work in terms of how it works, because I think it provides a really nice overview. You have to have your board that you're using have a very specific type of wiring for uh, connecting everything up. This again works with most ESP32 and STM32 based microcontrollers today. The one thing cool about using the, the Blue starter kit is that all of this is just done for you. You have your SWAN plugged in to the No Carrier F. You actually don't have to worry about wiring at all. Everything is good for you, good to go. The next thing is you have to enable outboard firmware update on your note card. This is, if you remember back when I said, we'll put a pin in this API, that's what this card.dfu call is doing. It's saying, hey, this is an STM32 based board and I want uh, outboard firmware update to be available. So I'm gonna set this on flag and set it to true. Next, you have to build your updated firmware image file. So the cool thing about this is that when you're updating these firmware images, you're updating the whole thing. You're basically completely wiping out everything on the host. Meaning I could go in here and change my app to my heart's desire. So what I would do in a, if we had a couple hours here, I take all this data coming in, I'd label it. I would build this into training and test sets. I develop a new model. I get it ready. I would import that model into my Zephyr app. I test it out locally. I'd make sure I'm good to go. I would do a build, which is going to create this new .bin file and put it into my app and sort of get that ready to deploy out to devices. The cool thing with outboard firmware update, though, is that once I have that binary, I don't have to like walk to all of my devices physically and plug a USB cable into them. Instead, if I go back to my fourth step, I'm going to upload, upload my firmware in NoteHub. So our cloud backend, back where we have our devices here, there's also another tab for working with firmware that I'm going to visit. See one of my earlier ones for testing. I got one, I got a firmware image file uh, ready to go so that we didn't have to watch me build all of this up that I'm going to upload to NoteHub now, a new version of this. And essentially the last step on our list to configure this is I just have to tell the note card uh, basically to apply this new firmware that I just uploaded to my device. So if I go back to my devices, I select this one, I'm going to go to host firmware, and I'm going to say I want to update it. And I'm going to say V3 is available and apply the update. And when I do this, I'm basically queuing up the note, the, the update on NoteHub. And my device, the next time it syncs, the next time it checks in with the cloud, is essentially going to detect that that new firmware update is available, download it, and apply it. So to do that, I am going to move some wiring around and bring over, if I can 
uh, sift through all the various uh, Zoom windows that are open here on my other monitor, bring up the note card terminal. So another cool feature we have, another cool thing we have at Blues is this in-browser terminal that lets you talk to a note card over serial direct directly in a web browser. And I'm going to fire off a pub.sync command, which is going to be the fastest way for this thing to find that this firmware image available is available and to start running the process of updating it on my device. So I'm going to run the sync. I'm going to turn on some extra logging so that we can uh, watch this thing go. And what should happen is within a second or two here, it should de detect that the new firmware was applied in NoteHub and start downloading it to the device and then applying it to the host. Looks like it's getting it there. So uh, DFU, I think it's it's finding it. Um, and then it's going to download it. And while this is running, I know, Zach, I think I'm going to leverage you again because you can provide a little bit of a better explanation of how once this thing has the binary image, um, how it actually goes about updating the host itself. Yeah, so what's happening, <clears throat> the note card works as a in-system programmer, just like the ST link. So I've got one sitting here. Uh, if you can see this guy right here. It works just like that guy. And so it's it's doing the same thing as what you'd see through the JTAG, is it's pulling down the, the strapping pin, so like the boot pin and the reset, and then it's going to write the firmware over to it on the, uh, over its, I don't know which UART it is. I think it's the LP UART. But anyway, it's going to write, just lay down the firmware over anything that's there. This requires no cooperation from the host whatsoever. So if you had bricked firmware or any kind of problem, like uh, the old fashioned way was that you had twice as much uh, flash as you needed and you use half the flash to run your program and half the flash to take the new binary so you can flip flop back and forth. And that means that you have to have fully functional host firmware in order to pull off an update. Whereas the new way, it just is just paves it and writes brand new firmware in. Doesn't matter the status or functionality of the existing host firmware. It's pretty awesome. And let's see if I, that was the perfect amount of talking too, because um, it got the new firmware version. I don't know if you saw me highlight that the new thing was available. And really all I put in the the new one is a, just a big log message. So uh, if it works, we should see a big thing. Oh, there we go. Hold on. It worked, trust me, but it's auto scrolling. I uh, tried to make it very obvious. All I did was put in this, that it worked and it updated my, my log. But in a more sort of realistic setting, right? I would have had my new model I have this out there, uh, the new model out there now running on my device. I could test it. Back in NoteHub, I would know that, see, the DFU status is completed. So I could even get crazy, right? I could divide, divide my devices into different fleets of devices. I could say, hey, I have a new model. I think it's going to work better. Let me push it out to these three devices or these fleet of devices and let them run for a while and just see what happens. Basically do a little bit of either both QA and a little bit of AB testing to see how it works. And then when I'm confident, I could take that same firmware image file and push it out to the rest of my devices. Really overall, the, the entire theme of what I'm trying to show you is that between uh, what we have at Blues with a note card, what Zephyr offers in terms of just how you can break up your apps and then Edge Impulse, you just have a lot of tools for optimizing your sort of ops scenario so that you can bring some of this, these continuous improvement processes that we know throughout the software development world and try to integrate that uh, into these ML types of processes. And I think that's what I wanted to show. Um, so Rob, I think I'm gonna turn it, things back to you. I do wanna make sure we drop the links to those repos in the chat if we haven't already, or maybe you're gonna put them up yeah. in the slides. Uh, in fact, it's a great time. Um, so yeah, sir, first of all, thank you um, to everyone for attending and, and special thanks to our speakers. That was a great demo, TJ. The two um, the two or the the two sets of code that TJ showed off are available with those bit.ly links at the top there. So the Zephyr firmware and the node endpoint. I also want to make sure you had access to the kind of the three different getting started paths for Zephyr, um, Edge Impulse, and Blues as well. So the bad news is we're out of time. 
Uh, the good news is we had surprisingly few questions uh, considering the number of people that are here. Um, I will say we're going to end the webinar now, but I just wanted to say you'll get an email hopefully tomorrow from me. If you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to just reply to that email and then I will get it on to you know Benjamin or David or Owen, whoever makes sense for your question um, or TJ or Zach. Zach loves uh, when I pester him with questions all day. So um, yeah, I will make sure you get all these resources and a link to the recording uh, tomorrow. So yeah, we'll just end there. Thanks again, everyone, for attending. Oh, Zach's Before pointing. Before you hang it up, hold on. So yep. there's a little conversation happening about getting the Docker container that we just showed off with Note Zephyr. Oh, Zach loves on Docker. All flavors. Yes, I do. Uh, on all flavors of operating system. And it does work. So if you're Linux, then you just run natively. You know how that works. No problems. Uh, and then we, I set it up so that you can, if you're on a Mac or if you're on Windows, we can just kind of skip the whole USB access to the Docker container problem. You just run OpenOCD natively on Windows or on Mac. And what it does is it opens up a port so that you have a connection to the machine, but it's over the internet, so to speak. And then the container will connect to OpenOCD over the internet that's on your machine. And then it has a clear path through. So this does work in a workshop setting where just like it blues, where everybody has their own flavor or favorite operating system, this works universally. So I just wanted to clear that up. There's a lot of typing for me, and I just get to save it this way. So Sounds you good. can't drop, uh, you can't mention Docker without having Zach jump in. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Bye, everybody.